Hello and welcome to the AV Forums podcast for the 2nd of October 2013. Welcome to October on the AV Forums weekly podcast and if you're listening to this on Wednesday when it goes live, it's only 83 days to Christmas. Joining us for this edition, Assistant Editor Steve Withers. My dick was squished by the TV. News Editor Mark Hodgkinson. We're going to party like the 80s. Games Editor Mark Botwright. Not going to let you down, Goose. Audio Reviewer Ed Selly. Proof Garfield Eye looks like a pair of tits. This past week has seen the Cedia Expo in Denver, where the great and good of custom installation get together for some training courses and the latest kit. Seemingly looking at the the reports coming out of the show, it hasn't been the 4K product fest that many were expecting. However, Cedia is a small show and we've just had IFA, which is the last major trade show of the year before CES, so um, I'm not really surprised at that and everything was more or less... Uh, announced at IFA. However, for some strange reason, JVC wait for Cedia US uh, every year, and this year was no different to announce their new DILA projectors, and there's no native 4K to be seen. No, uh, that is uh, a bit of a shock, to be honest, uh, considering that everyone's expecting a lot of... What the hell is that noise? Can't be me, I'm on mute. I'm on mute too. Ed, what are you doing to yourself? Well, I'm sorry, I just muted because there's. Um, I was trying to open a soft drink, but I assume that when I mute, I my mic mutes as well, but apparently not. No, it does not. Okay, right. Well, my, sorry, that's my mistake. I, I'll have to just pull the mic cord out the next it's time. It's very fizzy. That. It is incredibly fizzy. That was what I was trying to. <laughs> <laughs> right, so I start again. <laughs> <I'm laughs> done now. That was nice. Uh, yes. <clears throat> Uh, what are we talking about? <laughs> oh, JVC. Uh, yeah, bit of a surprise. No 4K. Uh, I think everyone was expecting them to come up with something. I mean, we kind of assumed that uh, eShift was a stopgap, that 4K will be coming late this year. Uh, not the case. Uh, they're all still just uh, eShift projectors, so 1080p panels with the eShift device um, basically making it a higher resolution when it's projecting, but it's still effectively a 1080p panel. Uh, it does accept a 4K input, but since they're going to get down res to 1080p and then up res again, that's kind of um, a bit pointless, to be perfectly honest. Uh, and uh, yeah, so you've got to think at the moment for their 700 and 900 series, up against the VW 500 at 8,500, 8, 8,800 pounds, which is a similar price point, uh, they're going to struggle, I think. But are they going to struggle? Because there's no 4K content. The, uh, the There's no standard yet. We don't know if it's going to be Rec 2020 or if they're going to stick with 709. HD, HDMI 2.0 is a bit of a fudge job once you actually start looking at the specs. Um, so are they going to lose out? Depends on how much em- emphasis you place on 4K, I suppose. If you want a projector that's future-proofed and can handle and actually has a 4K panel, you've only really got two choices. Um, if you place more importance on black levels, native black levels, that is, uh, then yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, JVCs are still... Uh, are still strong contenders. I just think that it, the numbers game will win out and people will, will plump for a 4K panel. But uh, the other thing, it, I wasn't that surprised about 4K, to be honest. I thought, well, they're either going to do it or they're not, and they're not. Uh, the thing that really surprised me was the dynamic iris. Um, why put a dynamic iris on a projector where the native contrast is already better than all of the competition? Uh, that just doesn't make any sense whatsoever to me. Isn't, no, that the numbers, isn't that the numbers game, though? They needed some big numbers so they can quote the dynamic contrast figures, and they look ridiculous, don't they? 150 million to one or so. Or so or I'm sure ridiculous. it's marketing department that's asked for this. I don't think... That's it. It's just numbers. They needed it. numbers, didn't they? JVC <laughs> projectors have fantastic uh, native contrast ratios already, but simply the best in the marketplace. So it seems strange to play that game when they don't need to. Uh, and it also means that you immediately start to draw conclusions, you know, comparisons between um, the two, you know, between Sony specifically here uh, and JVC, um, which they wouldn't have to do if they didn't do it in the first place. Does the NDA that, extend to how long they intend for this model to be? I mean, do they update the models annually? I guess is the big question because if they do, I don't think it's that 
significant, especially if there's well, not yes. a huge amount of additional sort of development gone into this one. And then they, they go with a more stabilized spec. They go full 4K next gen, I guess. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, they, they could be waiting for the specs. You know, how, how is the content going to be delivered? What is the specification? It's still very much a real great area. Um, like I say, once you, you get into the uh, nitty gritty of HDMI 2.0, there seems to be a lot missing there. Um, it yeah, seems it looks, to be it looks a, a bit rush. halfway house, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it's a, yeah, it's a rush job. Point one, I suspect, quite soon. Yeah, yeah, it looks like the manufacturers put pressure on HDMI org to get it out uh, before the standards bodies decided what the standards were going to be. So, I think it's subject to change. So it's it's going to be. We'll see a few revisions down the line. Yeah. So I mean, there's there's lots of uh, lots of conjecture at the minute as to how it's going to be delivered. Who's who's going to come up with a standard that's going to be accepted by the industry because you've not just got one standards body there's there's, there's a number of them uh, they all have to agree on on something um so you know yes the w the vw500 looks uh, appealing i haven't seen it myself yet uh looking forward to seeing it but you know would you buy that projector knowing that the standards could change and there might not be a way of uh, updating it. That could be a possibility. Or you stick with 1080p and maybe this is JVC's ploy, you know. Get eShift 3 out there, it might look good. And, um, you know, they update their models every year. Uh, so, you know, it's only another 12 months to the release the next model and it could be a native 4K with the correct standards and with, with the correct interface. Yeah, true. I mean, that is one way of looking at it. I'm a bit surprised at the price point on the 500. I think it's a bit too high. Uh, I think that would actually be a strong contender for all the reasons you just listed, Phil, uh, if it was a little bit cheaper. Um, I think 5,300, which is more than last year. I think it was 499 last year, the uh, 55. Um, I think that's a bit toppy. I think uh, they could have a real, a real strong seller if they drop the price a bit because it does offer all the advantages you've just listed. Um and there isn't really anything else in that price point. Uh, so sort of that three to four grand price point would be would be a strong contender there, I think, with an E-Shift device and, and the improved and superior black levels. Great contrast, nat- native contrast ratio. But at 5,300, that's starting to look a bit toppy. Yeah, but again, you know, they've got to bring this product in. They've got to price it to, and, and they've got to make a profit otherwise. Um, and we're going to come on to a, a story about, you know, uh, just how cutthroat this market is in a minute. Um, they have to price it so they make a profit so they still exist to bring out the native 4K projector next year. So um, I think they'll sell. The X35 staying on, so that's staying on as their budget projector, and that's a cracking little projector. So um, so they're still going to sell that. The 500, I can see that shifting. It's the 7 and the 900 um, where they're up against the, the Sony, and that's going to be interesting to see how they perform in that market and just how many people actually go for the VW over the over the uh, JVC and moving on we're talking about the the VW 500 VW 1100 has been announced 4K projector again from Sony this one's going to replace the 1000 and price between 17 and 20 grand Steve yeah I mean this basically I mean it's a it's a tweak to VW 1000 isn't it really um, in VW 1100, it, it looks like it's just a VW 1000 with a few changes here and there to bring it up to spec because obviously the VW 1000 is, uh, is getting on a bit now, 18 months old, is it? I think nearly two years, in fact, since we first saw it. So getting a little long in the tooth, they've, they've basically updated it to VW 1100. I'm guessing it'll be you know around 18 grand, double the price of the uh, of the VW 500, roughly. Um, and that's aimed at the custom install market last year, I expect. I mean, I can't see personally if I, you know, why I would go for the VW 1100 when you can get the VW 500, which well, obviously isn't, it has, doesn't have quite as good, say, lens, lens array as, as the VW 1100 and has other features like it's not quite as bright. But, you know, in terms of overall performance, uh, from what I saw at least, VW 500 looks looks like a very attractive prospect and it would be difficult to justify the additional, you know, sort of uh, nine grand on top of that. But, um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, that's just uh, Sony's kind of flagship um, flagship 4K mo- model, and they dominate the 4K market right now. I mean, in terms of 4K projectors, that's your choice, Sony or Sony. Okay, so that's our 4K news and sort of 4K news uh, for this week. Moving on to some bad news. Uh, Toshiba set to axe 3,000 jobs in the TV division, uh, and they're going to increase their outsourcing. Uh, not really a surprise. You just have to look at the TV market. You just have to look at the figures. Um, 
certainly in the UK, it's it's saturation now. Uh, you're very lucky to. There's no market there basically, unless you're selling luxury goods. It it seems so. Not surprised at that news, Mark. Um, no. And and the I mean, they, they shut they shut down. The uh, this is we're talking. Um, this is act, our overseas production. Um, it's all based overseas now. They shut it down. Their stuff in Japan last year. So uh, there are three remaining factories: uh, China, Indonesia, and Poland. Two of those are going. Half the workforce, uh, as you say, outsourcing will now represent seventy percent of their TV lineup, which was forty percent previously. Uh, and as you say, they're just they're just struggling in, a, in an extremely cutthroat market, both from. Um, the rise of Samsung and LG, the Korean brands, and then the Chinese and the Taiwanese manufacturers are coming on the shirt tails as well. Uh, yeah, they're up against it. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how, I mean, from experience, I've done quite a lot of Toshiba panels over this last couple of years, and it's always evident which is the uh, outsourced model. There's always a few more bugs, little annoyances on it. Uh, and they're actually the ones they produce themselves are pretty reasonable, but um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see how they go with this. It's a long. It's interesting to draw some parallels with BlackBerry, though, with Toshiba. You're talking about a company that was a diff. I mean, obviously, they didn't have quite the same dominant position that BlackBerry did, but they had a defined, a very defined market position. They made some cracking high-end. CRTs, and then the moment that that technology sort of petered out, and other other players came in with other other aspects of technology, it, there was just never the same sense of brand identity. I don't really know what would define a Toshiba product if I was to set about buying one at this point, and that has to have an effect after a while. When, as you say, we're in a saturated market, you've got to try and define what your your product means in in terms of everyone else. Well, unfortunately, I mean the lower end TVs are basically just supermarket TVs with a Toshiba brand badge on, because they're, they're manufactured by Vestal, who, who make a lot of the TV uh, that go to, into supermarkets. So they're, they're effectively, except with the smart features aside, perhaps, but effect, effectively they're a supermarket brand with a mainstream. Uh, Badge on the front. Hello, Tosh. Got a Toshiba. Gone, a, <laughs> gone are those days. Yeah, that, I mean, that was a brand identity, wasn't it? That it was. It sticks in your head. Um, you know, the same as uh, Sony had with Trinitron, and um, I'm trying to think of some of the others that were around at the time. But definitely, you know, the the whole Hello, Tosh. You got a Toshiba brand marketing really was big. Uh, uh, during CRT and LE, LCD, uh, they made some really nice models. But the thing that always frustrates me with Toshiba, I've been on a few of their press trips uh, over the years, and you get to see all this uh, high-end technology that they have in their TVs and high-end TV models. Uh, and these are usually pan-European events uh, that they hold, and then you go into the UK press briefing, uh, just to be told that all the, the really superb models that have the, the best picture processing and design and all the rest of it aren't coming to the UK. Yeah, I mean, they were the, I think that's right, isn't it? The first out of the gates with the consumer 4K TV, weren't they? But we never we never got it over here. Z, what was it? Z1, Z2? Um, yeah, let's say. Wasn't that glasses free? Um, was it the first glasses free? It but wasn't the first. It used, the, it used the 4K panel. It but, just used the 4K uh, panel. It wasn't. That's it right. Sorry. 4K, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, signal. Uh, no, it wasn't. Course, it couldn't right. be used as a 4K TV. No, absolutely you're right. So yes. So just a rubbish 3D TV instead. Yeah. <laughs> Very expensive. Hooray. 3D yeah, TV. I think I did it. The, 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 just no brand identity. Nothing setting setting them apart. The smart features lag behind everyone else's. The catching it was design a bit, but you know, it's just. Yeah, this just doesn't seem the space for them at the moment. I mean, by the same token, obviously we've got we've got companies that are, you know, we we, we have they have a much stronger brand identity at this, and um, we we perceive the products they're making to be vastly better. Tragically, it still doesn't mean they're actually making any money, but uh, at yeah. least they they you know that there, there's more there's there's more to it, if you will. So yeah, I mean, it must be said, uh, I I didn't know the the breakdown of the, the three thousand people they were getting rid of. I did think for for one sort of fairly horrifying moment, if there's much overlap with the four and a half thousand that blackberry are getting shot of there are certain professions around the world that you really don't want to be trying to look for a job for in at the moment you should start running a deadpool really shouldn't we on which uh, tv manufacturer pulls out of the market entirely in the near future because i'm sure some of them are going to be the way things are going 
But what? Yeah, well, you say that, but I mean, this is where you really start running into problems. What else? What other categories is Toshiba? I wouldn't say necessarily strong in, but what, do we know know what they're at the other categories? They they yeah, well, laptops. They're pretty laptops. Strong in. Yeah, I'd yeah, say that was there. Yeah, they got they got other markets where they are quite strong in actually, but not TVs anymore. That's a fact. Um, they really have. You know, I mean, I don't. I haven't actually reviewed a Toshiba for a couple of years. Mark's handled them uh, almost exclusively recently, but. Um, but reading his reviews, I get the impression that more and more of them are just rebadged vegetables. Yeah. I think the last one I had in, which was, oh, I can't remember the name, but a seven series. I think that was Toshiba produced. It had some good points, but you can, yeah, it's, um, it didn't have too many bugs, but you could, the Vestal ones are often sluggish and little picture ruining annoyances like, like black, remote controls. black light. Oh, ridiculous remote controls. <laughs> what are they doing with those? The succession of <laughs> crazy remotes that have come out of them. I, don't, I really don't know. They spent a lot of money on this, uh, what's his name? Jakob, Jakob Jensen uh, design yeah. house. Yeah. So they, spe- they spent a, they an awful lot of budget on the worst remote control in the history of the world with that yeah, It looked quite thing. pretty, but when you, you get couldn't to couldn't hold it. it. No. <laughs> the thing Go is, on. though, the high-end models that he's done, they look absolutely brilliant in terms of design and uh, uh, and the picture processing, it, processing that's on board and all the rest of it, yet they won't bring it into this market. Nah. They won't bring it into the UK. So, you know, they've only got themselves really to blame if if, if their brand is now seen as uh, supermarket level because they're not bringing in the high-end stuff. They're not trying to create a, uh, a market, a, a niche in the market for themselves. So, you know, they've only got themselves to blame if they're, if they're trying to compete with the likes of Finlux and uh, the other big boys who who can knock these cheap models out there. And, and, you know, there's not a lot of money we've made, if any money, off that. And it was obvious at their press launch this year that they were targeting the budget end of the market, which seems like a strange thing to do when there's no margin there and it's quite competitive. Yeah, um, it just seems like they're doing it for the sake of it, of, of getting the brand into the living room and maybe pushing the smart features going forwards, but half-hearted. Interesting that you mentioned what, what else are they known for? Laptops. Oh, there's a dying market. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good point, actually. <laughs> right. Anyway. Not an easy since HD DVD, to be fair. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well. Oh, that, yeah, another that, winner for them, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, that really, that really did hurt them. It really did. Anyway. At least they co-developed the cell processor that was in the PS3. <laughs> <laughs> so that revenue stream is about to dry up as well. Yeah. Right. Just to wrap up on hardware news, uh, Samsung and LG, the usual thing, but it looks like they're burying the hatchet this time around, Mark. Yeah, it looks like they finally the sensors prevailed. A number of uh, OLED pot- potents, patents were in dispute. Um, and on the advice of uh, South Korea's, uh, one of the business ministers, I can't remember his name. Um, it's Kim. It, it probably <laughs> Kim so- something. They, they've decided to bury it all and just get on with it and just concentrate on uh, beating the opposition into the ground between them. So, um, yeah, which includes the Japanese, obviously. Um, OLED's obviously an emerging market. Uh, don't want to be bogged down with costly lawsuits. Samsung's certainly had enough of that in the recent past. So, yeah, in an attempt to perhaps beat the Japanese all together and uh, stem the Chinese flood, they are now friends and no further action will be taken at least this week i'm assuming they're trying to sort of you know work out and make the damn things of cost effectively and it would seem like a good idea for them yeah to i mean why not together, why not why not share the know-how, which i'm sure that does goes on to a certain extent but if they shared their collective r d you know without giving too much away then you know they might be able to get a price well, advantage early Sony and panasonic obviously did that in the past although panasonic were very keen to emphasize that they aren't no longer yeah. doing that on their current uh, generation of 4K TV but uh, certainly they uh, they were sharing um sharing tech on the on the 4K OLED that we saw at well, having uh, said CES. that yes Samsung and LG have completely gone the opposite way haven't they so um the LG's is the WRGB yeah that's true so maybe maybe there isn't too much to be sure. production processes must be relatively similar even though your approach is slightly different actually you know I was at a meeting once where I met a uh, a, a South Korean and he gave me his business card uh, I'm not making this up. His name was Kim Bum Suck. And <laughs> I was t- in tears trying we not see, to I've, laugh I've, and keep I've, a straight face in the meeting. One thing uh, that LG employees do is that they take on Western names. Um, so they all have Western names. Um, 
basically when the when they they meet clients from uh from the west and uh but some of them they pick up some <laughs> some pretty strange <laughs> western uh names one one of them is called superb <laughs> yeah, I used to do that in uh, in Hong Kong. I met, a, I met a cowboy Lee. I met a Donkey Kong. <laughs> I'm sorry, if we're playing the silly name game, my wife used to work for the Human Genome Organization and a very senior member of the US group of the Human Genome Organization is the magnificently named Dr. Dick Bumgamer. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and you know, he presumably has the option to be called Richard, but no, he's Dick Bum Gamer. You know, there's there's just no 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 beating that as far as I can work out. Wasn't wasn't there some US politician Randy Bum Gardner as well? Yes. Yes, there was. Just like, yes. Uh, so that wraps up uh, hardware news. We'll come back in a second with games news. So moving on to uh, games news, uh, some big news from Valve. Yep, um, some people said that it was their announcement might have been a bit of a damp squib. They kind of teased they were going to be doing something with Linux and revolutionising, well, trying to revolutionise gaming in the living room. And they've basically revealed a few of the facts about what will be dubbed the Steam Boxes, these kind of little specialised PCs that are set to go in people's living rooms and play the Steam library. Um, they're going to have their own OS for it. Uh, a lot of people thought it might just be Linux as they've been working to get games uh, basically playing on that with in Steam. Um, but they're going to be developing their own OS based on Linux. So it's still basically they're going for an open system. Um, you can put it on PCs. There's going to be no licensing fee. It will so be free to consumers. Um, there's a little question about whether Valve will actually limit which manufacturers can use it because obviously they want to avoid some kind of influx of poorly constructed Steam boxes, you know, kind of flooding the market with poor UIs and the like. And kind of Seabird out there. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Controversial. <laughs> but then the kind of really big announcement, I mean, everyone pretty much expected this, but the big announcement was their redesigned controller for it. Which you know, if I assumed was going to be just pretty much a standard gamepad of some kind, and you would have some form of of being able to play mouse keyboard games. But they've released something that looks positively Weird. space. <laughs> yeah, it is. It, it's a little bit space age. Um, there's no analog sticks, so you've got dual track pads. You've got these kind of concave track pads, um, and there's. They're going to be using haptic feedback to try and create some a more mechanical feel to it all. Um, a lot of people have kind of automatically written it off as it looks uh, ridiculous, but the, you know the, the whole point about this open system and the whole point of trying to get people playing basically PC games in the living room is that it's an open system. You can use whatever controller you like. If you if you want to pair up your Xbox 360 controller, you'll still be able to do that. If you want to use keyboard and mouse, you can still do that. This is basically, they've tried to create some form of controller that can replicate what, what the positives of a keyboard-mouse combo are, but that you can hold it in your hands. And so it, it seems though trackpads, high-resolution trackpads, will they're hoping be able to simulate that that precision that you get from from a mouse. Um, a, a few uh, developers who've used it have kind of broken cover and said how great it feels. Um, this kind of precision haptic feedback is supposed to give it very much a mechanical feel. So um, things like momentum, as you can just quickly swipe across it, the, the hope is that you can get things like a little ticking sound that will will indicate exactly how fast it's going and that kind of thing. It's got a touch screen. It's got multiple buttons. No standard face buttons there because it's a, with the two trackpads, it's it's an, a symmetrical design. So therefore, it's right-handed and left-handed people, which a lot of people will be quite pleased about. And they gave a little example about how Portal 2, how the button configuration would map to it. It looks absolutely balmy at first first viewing but it does make a lot of sense and it, it's nice that a company is actually taking a little bit of a risk here when yeah you know we've all we've seen from 
PS4 and Xbox One controllers are refinements on the same same ideas, and basically it keeps PC gaming and console gaming as separate. This is something that's designed to hopefully try and unite the two. I confess I don't understand all of the things it does, but uh, exactly what you say there. It's good to see someone at least trying to innovate. Um, and that has to be has to be sort of saluted. I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm no one to judge on this. I remember looking at the original Xbox controller and thinking that's so large. They um, they're gonna have to redesign that because it, it's dreadful. And obviously, they didn't. And people bought them by the by the stack load. So yeah, I, I, whatever my thoughts on it. And it looks very strange. I'm I'm sure I'm hoping it will do extremely well. Going back to Steam, but the Steam boxes, which I've, I've missed a lot on Mark. Um, what what kind of spec are they going to be? Are they going to be Low well, end ish, mid at mid. What? How would they compare to a, a proper gaming rig? Well, uh, the the assumption we don't really know that much about them at, at this point, but the assumption is that you know it's going to be coming from different manufacturers. No one actually knows yet if, if Valve themselves will be making their own, but it, yeah, it will have to be uh, you know different kind of SKUs, and you'll basically be seeing. There was one Pretty back much. at CES, wasn't there? I'm just thinking. Uh, was it? There was one kind of, yeah, there was one little one. It looked like a little X or something. XI3 yeah. or Z3, Z- would you say it? Something like that. I'm just looking back. I, just, I, remember, I remember that. I just remember one pre-CES, there was something came in. Uh, yeah, nothing, it was I'm one of those. Nothing, nothing more about it since. No, it was one of those little boxes that it kind of, you know, it broke cover and everyone kind of said, oh, well, that's a bit of a damp squib. And then it, it, it almost kind of, Pulled the rug out from some of the enthusiasm for the Steam boxes, but it was yeah, priced. It, it was priced badly, wasn't it? Something. Like yeah. That. The the assumption is is that you'll be able to upgrade them. You know, they'll come in at a various different price points. So therefore, you know, if you're just playing on um, you know 720p or something, if you think about what the average PC gaming rig, the res- resolutions that it's aimed to try to get, then you know a fairly low spec gaming pc should be able to cope with you know the living room set very very easily so it should be affordable with with regards whether the new next generation of consoles are coming in um but they're going to have these betas that are 300 steam boxes are going to go out and hopefully early well sometime in 2014 they should be released properly um fingers crossed it's in the first half of the year but i wouldn't be surprised if it gets pushed back a little bit it's tough ask i think still i mean i think the consoles are gonna have it hard this time around uh just to get the competition from the mobile gaming uh and then it's another box that's got to be fit in essentially being sold as a console wouldn't you say really trying to uh, a bit more uh a bit more simplistic than a than the gaming pc or at least how a gaming pcs are are regarded as um it, a more of a simple plug and play such, uh, solution than that. Um, yeah, I, I think they'll have a tough time with it. Well, I think if you look at, I mean, if if you look at the parallels with say smartphones, with Apple's closed system and how Android has really kind of taken off, I think that's what they're perhaps looking at. Which is, mm. you know, some people don't want the necessarily to be able to they they don't want to tinker, but they want to know that they have the ability to if they so choose. Um, and it's that kind of consumer empowerment that they're probably going for. And also, Steam sales put digital distribution on consoles just to shame. Yeah, Up until true. the point of PlayStation Plus, console deals for you know online downloading anything has just been so abysmal. Um, so if they can get it out there as almost like a second console, because I know a lot of people usually end up, myself included, kind of buying everything out there. But there's going to be so little, I think, between these the next gen consoles this time around that I think a lot of people have also kind of discounted getting a second console in the form of whatever Nintendo are planning because of the Wii U, and so therefore you've you've got a space there. It will be I can see a lot of people going down the PS4 plus Steambox route because as good as the consoles have been with regards online, I've never seen a scene that's quite matched what you can get on PC. You know, yeah. dedicated servers that people make when you get some little community that come up with their own servers and their own rules and they run the same game. You know, Team Fortress 2, I would always go to PC for. What about Euro Truck Simulator 2? <laughs> That's only on PC. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, they did name drop that, so, you know. I think more out of uh, bafflement than anything else, but uh, yes. There's a market. Clearly. 
if you've uh, you must have said I, uh, obviously I, I sent the link to you guys about the, uh, the this latest version of uh, Microsoft Train Simulator um, they had a sort of obviously like the websites that like other websites they have uh, a, a feed of relate of, of related tweets running in the corner of it and there there was genuine excitement in some of those tweets I don't want to be stuck in a lift with those people but I am pleased that it's clearly been a big week for them you know we, we, we get we get lost in uh, the Grand Theft Auto fives in this world but you know if, if you want to drive a train last week was a good week actually you could you could drive the train whilst tweeting crash it just like that guy in spain did uh you know make it very realistic the Breaking whole, the the whole wall of, of train dynamics yeah <laughs> no you can't take that corner at 200 miles an hour <laughs> well, I, I, I mean i have to say this presumably is uh, i don't know maybe maybe this is the, the 12 year old in me but surely after a while of of training it up that must be what you do. You must go, okay, that's fine. Now what happens if I turn everything up to 11 and, and try and go around this thing? And presumably just to get the most spectacular train explosion you can. Good, good if, they, if they had like a you know, third-person view of a massive train wreck. That I could I think probably they be do. up for. <laughs> well, in that case, yeah, that like, <laughs> it could be really good fun. <laughs> it's always more fun to destroy than to create. <laughs> This is true, but if you think all the way back to the original like Microsoft Flight Simulators, it's like, yeah, I, I, I want to do a barrel roll. Oh, no, you can't do that. The wings will come off. It's like, oh, okay, then. It doesn't really... I mean, it's very realistic. It's just not a lot of fun. So we ran out of steam on yeah. this one? <laughs> we ran out of steam, yeah. Yeah, nice. <laughs> I've been waiting 13 minutes to come in with that one. <laughs> <laughs> right, is that, is that it for games, is it? Yeah, yeah, okay, that'll okay. do. Okay. I'm, I'm very excited. No one else is. About what? <laughs> That's Steam box. Oh, oh, you are right. excited. We're, we're, we're pleasantly tell, moist. Okay. No, pleasantly moist, but we're not exactly excited. But I have <laughs> sort of, of semi interest. Could be a controller that's got electromagnets inside. The controller, I, 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 I'm, I'm, looking, I'm getting more excited about that than the Steam box. Okay, that wraps up uh, Games News, and we'll be back in a sec with Tech News. <laughs> Right, moving on to tech news, and uh, Mr. Ballmer left and gave his farewell uh, speech to Microsoft employees. Did anybody catch this? I got it. Involved there a lot of shouting. <laughs> it involved shouting. It involved crying and <laughs> and dirty dancing. There's nothing worse than seeing a fat man no. sweat and cry, is there? <laughs> Did it involve humility? <laughs> <laughs> well, well not much. here's a here's a quick snippet. He's now crying. I'm just going to enjoy. I just want to enjoy this for a minute. Sound like. Yeah. Soak it in, all of you. Soak it in. <laughs> you work for the greatest company in the world. <laughs> Soak it in! And I want to say thank you! I want to say thank you! Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you! This isn't about any one person. It's about this company. It's about a company that's important, that's forward-thinking, that's cool. innovative, that's ethical, that hires great people and leads, lets them lead great lives, <laughs> that helps people around the world realize their full potential. It's my He's now crying again. That was emotional, wasn't it? <laughs> Is the crazy may Microsoft enjoy it for a like moment, but thanks to YouTube, we can enjoy it forever. <laughs> Children do leave the house. A song that looked back retrospectively. So he, he, he wants to play a song that, to and end a song the whole thing that now. celebrated the future. Just listen to this choice. It's from one of my favorite movies. It's one of my favorite songs. And I think it has all that in it. This goes downhill guess, very quickly. A song that comes at the very end of a movie. Titanic, where it? one of the actors gets up on stage and talks about kind of how he likes to do things. 
Well, it's not, where is my mind by the I want to end with this song. It's going to be, I mean, I've had Get the Respectful. Song. Here we go. This is the important bit. It talks about what you've meant to me and what you've done for, for me. You've made this the time of my, my life. <laughs> Right, you ready for this? He now starts dancing. <laughs> well, I suppose if you if you want to make your exit and uh, <laughs> make sure everybody knows about it, that's one way of doing it. Can I just say, no one put Steve Ballmer in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> now, nah, thank you, Stephen. F*** off. Give me a sec. he kill himself at the end of Dirty Dancing? Which version of oh. Dirty Dancing did you watch? <laughs> <laughs> the extended cut. <laughs> the, doesn't the Patrick Swayze character kill himself? He should do. I don't think he does. off with Jennifer Grey. Does he not? So what, what the hell am I thinking of? I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, you're thinking of an officer and gentleman where one of the characters kills himself. No, I could have sworn it was Dirty Dancing. I've never seen the film. I wish, I wish someone had killed the cast of Dirty Dancing. Yeah, at the start. A, at a film. Sure it, wasn't a, sure it wasn't a Donnie Darko? <laughs> <laughs> he missed a good opportunity there, though. He could have picked something else. The whole thing just sounded like a pop concert, a bad pop concert. Or a religious <laughs> cult. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, one, or the, one or the other. It's not yeah. having out glasses of Kool-Aid, don't f- drink it. <laughs> yeah, if he said, yeah, I- I'm leaving now, it's time for us all to rendezvous with a spaceship behind the moon. <laughs> if you'd like to reach for the special green bottle under your seats. It's a great company. <laughs> I think companies have proved over the years that you can have quite crazy people in charge of them and they're still perfectly capable of producing product which is completely and utterly day-to-day ordinary so you know great so crazy leads to mediocrity well no henry ford was properly mental it didn't stop you know him producing you know changing the way that we we view the car and building some some pretty bloody good ones you know, it, it just comes with the territory, especially if you're sort of owner operator as well. That that, that that's a, that's a, a carte blanche to be profoundly mental. The guy, who, uh, Mr. Kellogg, he was bonkers. Yeah, absolutely. Walt Disney. Yeah, well, he, yeah. was, he was an anti-Semite. I don't think he was mad. Well, there's so a fairly too. fairly hefty overlap in that Venn diagram, surely. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, from one company that thinks it, it, it's the best brand out there, um, to the one that actually is, <laughs> to, to the one that actually. Is the best brand out there, according to who is it that put this together, Mark? See now, yes. Apple should use the Dirty Dancing theme <laughs> in the next TV advert. <laughs> yeah, they, should, they definitely should. Uh, Interbrand. <laughs> Interbrand, yeah. So they, Interbrand. Interbrand say Apple are the best brand, knocking Coca Cola into third place because second goes to Google. Yeah, um, it's the rise of the technology companies this this time around, just uh, reflecting their global importance. Um, these, uh, this Interbrand uh, report has been going for 13 years. Uh, Coca-Cola has been top right from the start. Um, I'm glad to see that people are more interested in tech than some fizzy sugared water. <laughs> yeah, I am as well. <laughs> Time. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't even like Coke. Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm assuming there must be some strange arbitrary rules behind this. Well, yeah, I think I was looking into to the way they do it. It's, a lot of it's based on on uh, on their financial performance. To be fair. Uh, and then customer satisfaction surveys and a, a number of things are taken into account. They've got an they've got an ISO for this, so it, they're obviously it's quite in depth. Um, I think it's the one that everyone looks to as being the the best study of its sort. Uh, yep, yeah, and so the technology companies are coming up fast. Um, Apple, when this started 13 years ago, uh, had a brand value calculated at 6.6 billion dollars, and now 13. Uh, years on, uh, they're 15 times that, at nearly $100 billion, Apple, uh, which comfortably beats off everyone else. But as you say, Google came up into uh, second position, and we've seen Amazon rising there up to uh, number 19, Facebook, arguably tech, arguably not, um, number 52, Samsung at number 8 now, uh, 
their uh, their net worth has gone up 20% according to this studies. Um, of course, there were some spectacular fall, uh, spectacular um, descents as well this year, uh, notably BlackBerry, Nokia, Dell, and Nintendo. So their their uh, their worth is falling quite rapidly. Ooh. But do we agree? Is Apple the best brand in the world? Well, as I say, there has to be some arbitrary rules about this. Don't get me wrong. As a mass consumer brand, which it is, yes. I, I don't have too much of a problem with listing it as number one. I, I'd say know, it's the most recognisable brand in the world. But right? when you compare it to, say, I don't know, Porsche, in terms of a brand of, you know, unimpe- essentially where if you look at hits and misses, quality of product, aspiration of product, it's, it's on a, a different ball game, surely. Um and as yeah, is a number of other designer elements, but so there I, has to be turnover taking a huge role in this. I think it does. I think I think yeah, exactly. It. I thought Apple turn over so much money uh, that, that I think that's just propelled them <laughs> into yeah. into the top spot, really. As opposed to an Apple turnover. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, don't get me wrong. Yes, as a, as a as a combination of then turning that into into just moolah. Yeah, they're they're incredibly incredibly successful i just i don't i don't aspire to have an iphone 5s in the same way that i aspire eventually one of these days to die in a fireball in a shiny porsche 911 so you know that's uh i guess that's my take on it you could at least do it do it in a porsche spider which one i don't know whichever one james dean crashed <laughs> They're worth big money now because it wasn't just James Dean that drove them into solid objects and died. <laughs> they were very, very dangerous little cars, those original spiders. So, uh, yeah, so it'd be quite an expensive pastime to uh, to go out like uh, like, you, like your hero in that regard. Well, I'm sure that someone will make you a plastic replica that you could do a, a fairly sterling job in. I was just looking if, if Porsche were there, but the, uh, the site's offline right now. So I can't, I can't even tell you that. Bless. It's got to be a mix of what's identifiable and what's within the reach of the majority of the population, surely. Yeah, I, I don't have a problem with this list. I'm just saying that in outright, you know, uh, it, in the description of... No the, one's picking a MacBook over a Rolls-Royce, are they? You know. <laughs> well, no, one's profoundly hard to get to work in. Um, so, yeah, I know where you're coming from. Although that said, it's interesting because Rolls-Royce, I mean, don't get me wrong, Porsche has its own connotations with you know the the yuppie connotations and and and, and other things R- rolls royces i mean I, rolls royces for, they're coming out of it now a bit but they are still indelibly associated with with northern comedians and, and <laughs> they are fairly naff as a result of that and they're having to work quite hard to denaff themselves in a way that a number of other luxury car brands don't really suffer from that problem in the same way that if i see anyone in a cadillac they're either ghetto fabulous or a million years old if you don't fill into one of those categories what well, i don't understand why you'd own one but you know and it's the same with not just cars it's the same with all sorts of brands they have um, maybe because of the users that they've picked up and so on and so forth that, that that affects your perception of them as well if you fall outside that group but there's a certain amount of people who would say exactly the same thing about apple products um yeah i think that's fair i i think um the they're just ubiquitous people, enough that they they manage to kind of outweigh that i think um I think it's got actually got better for them in so much. Ironically, as you know, more people have used them and more people have been more sanguine about things that they're not so good at as well as good at. Actually, Apple users have become less insufferable over the years than actually when it was just a, a small clique of weirdos going, "Oh, I need it for my graphics processing," and it was just, yeah, they they were very strange and people. I did, again, I didn't want to be stuck in a lift with. We're making an awful lot of enemies today. <laughs> You know who's who's locked to market down still though, Armitage Shanks. Um, yeah. If you were gonna say, all right, name me another toilet manufacturer. Ideal standard. You knew that. Do one. you really? Well, that's Toto. <laughs> I don't know. As uh, I only say this because for whatever reason, my my house is equipped with two ideal standard toilets. I think Armitage exactly Shanks are just more toilet to do. Badge conscious, aren't they? Armitage Shanks always got the name on there. I don't think every other toilet manufacturer bothers. <laughs> 
<laughs> you get, it's just going to piss for, the, for the obvious reason. Like, <laughs> for the obvious reason. Shit on. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. I have said this before. It's one of the things I would aspire to do. If I was Roman Abramovich wealthy, I wouldn't buy myself a Premier League football club, but I would offer to sponsor one in dire financial straits on behalf of Armitted Shanks or Amosol <laughs> or something like that, just for the unbridled joy of watching 30,000 plus idiots wearing a bry nylon shirt with Armitage shanks written across the front of it. That would make me happy on a level I can't easily describe. <laughs> but I guess that's because I'm not a very nice person. I don't understand a toilet manufacturer called Ideal Standard. I think they do other other, other porcelain and ceramic items as well. I'm not totally specialist. <laughs> oh, fair enough. <laughs> I haven't put uh, that much thought into it, but you asked me to name another, another company that makes toilets, and I did. Sorry. I think Are you all now frantically Googling that. toilet manufacturers? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's why it's gone quiet for a second. Isn't it? P. Uh, Green. Right. That's a good name for us. <laughs> yeah. A toilet manufacturer. Not so good if your P is green. Why do you always end up talking about shit in one <laughs> form or another? Right, go on, Phil. Segue into the next one. <laughs> yeah. Get out of that. <laughs> What's the next topic? So that wraps up tech, and uh, we'll be back in a second with movie news. Uh, so we're not going to talk about uh, Breaking Bad. Um, we're going to leave that well alone. However, Mad Men, The Wire, Sopranos, uh, all been announced for Sky Box Set treatment on demand and all in HD. I can I finally know. sit down and watch The Sopranos in full HD. I'm looking forward to that. So that's an announcement today. Uh, it went on the site, Mark? Yes, that's quite nice, isn't it, for Sky customers? <laughs> well, do you want me to talk thanks, about it? Thanks for that insight, Mark. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought you were going to chat about it. Oh, we've got some brilliant pundits on this podcast. Right, <laughs> other movie news. Thunderbirds are go. Explain this one, Steve. Uh, well, there's going to be a new uh, ITV-produced kids series uh, called Thunderbirds Ago. So basically, an uh, updated version of Thunderbirds. Um, this is going to be CG animation uh, by Weta, actually. Weta, uh, Peter Jackson's company, and down in uh, New Zealand. So uh, it should look quite good. And they're using the original uh, voice actor who did um, Parker in the original Super Mario Nation uh, TV show from the 60s. And also Bosman Pike is going to be doing, uh, playing, well, providing the voice rather for Lady Penelope. Um, I'm, quite, I'm quite looking forward to this. I was a big fan of Thunderbird as a kid, uh, as I suspect most of us were. Um, they did a, a movie in 2004, a live action film. It was bloody awful. Unfortunately, he made that classic mistake for a kid's film of assuming that because it's a kid's film, it has to be about kids, which obviously is not, not the case at all. I mean, Star Wars is a great kids film, but it's not about children. Um, but in Thunderbirds, the movie, they um, concentrate on the youngest member of the Tracy family and some of his friends, and they're running around doing stuff. And it's hardly got any of the Thunderbirds actually in it, which kind of seems a bit pointless. If you're making a film called Thunderbirds, put the bloody Thunderbirds in there. Uh, it bombed, thank God. So that's why, I suspect, because there wasn't enough Thunderbirds action. Um, the TV series, though, uh, Thunderbirds, okay, it should be, I think it's um, next year it's going to um, screen on ITV, um, which probably will be the only reason I'd watch ITV. Uh, half hour episodes, um, yeah, and CG animation. So I guess that's that's kind of exciting. Uh, getting a bit of a bit of a. I mean, didn't Jerry Anderson die last year? I think so. Um, yes. Yeah, at the Bible Age of eighty three, I believe. Uh, but yeah, so I'm a bit of a fan of Ronsman Pike too. So unfortunately, she's not actually going to be in it physically, which is a shame. But uh, it'll be. Uh, it'll be I think it'll be fun uh, as long as the effects are done well. And I guess if it's wetter, they should be. So you saw the original series in your twenties, then, Steve. I don't know. I, I hope, presumably, once again, they'll be setting it in a in in the future. The problem is that it's a different sort of future that we perceive now than the one that Jerry Anderson did. I mean, let's face it. Part of the reason why Thunderbirds were continuously in demand is that absolutely everything in the original Thunderbirds was nuclear powered, and sooner or later, it you know decided that it was going to have an off day and you know turn into uh, something that was about to irradiate a large portion of the globe. I I, I just don't feel that we'd be having the same the same sort of T tell that to it's japan weird. mate <laughs> it, <laughs> it is weird does. when you look it's when you look back static, at the kind of sci-fis from you know the kind of 50s and 60s and their view of the future it was kind of vaguely steampunk before it was you know this idea of kind of it, it was half nuclear powered half mechanical future yes i mean there's an episode with the crab logger which I know sounds like a horrible disease, but it's not. It's a big yellow thing. 
and they all got food poisoning because they ate foreign food you know in in, in typical 19, 1960s view of, uh, of of things that weren't boiled to death um but the crab logger was i think it was nuclear powered it basically was just designed to cut a sort of motorway sized swathe through a forest it it probably wouldn't be it probably something that environmentally risque is unlikely to feature in the remake let's put it like that but they've got the hood i mean he was kind of a terrorist wasn't he so they can always play off the back of that some sort of terrorist activity blowing up stuff that's always good fun i'm as sure they, they can have, find as things as they that have can go the fire flash because that was cool as well it was like concord on steroids and insanely dangerous as well you know? uh, yeah that was a good one i i, I had thunderbird one two three and four uh, as um toys as a kid didn't have Thunderbird 5, and whoever was in Thunderbird 5, he drew the short straw, didn't he? he was stuck up in space on his own the whole time. On, which one was it? It wasn't Virgil, was it? Hang on. Uh, Scott, Alan, Virgil. Who were the other two? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, it, it appears to be, yeah, it was, you did, yeah, we don't like you very much. You manned this space station for six months. <laughs> Bye! Nobody else watch it? Uh, I preferred Stingray. No, you see, I found, I, for me... I found it weird, Stingray. Um, Thunderbirds just had more dynamics because it could take place underwater if it wanted to, but it also did stuff out of the water as well. I preferred that, but I, by the same token, I didn't. I, you know, Captain Scarlet was the ultimate one. I didn't like that at all. So I was convinced that the guy doing the voice of Captain Scarlet was actually um, Cary Grant because he sounded just like him. I just loved it when they had to have the close-ups of their hands. It would be a big hairy real hand. <laughs> 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 I was like, didn't think we were going to notice that. <laughs> They should keep that. Cut away to yeah, the CG. Yeah. <laughs> the cut away to a real hand. <laughs> Tattoos and sovereign rings and everything. So continuing uh, movie news, uh, another TV series. <laughs> Martin Freeman <laughs> cast in Fargo. He's based That's on a film. Do, so <laughs> it's been a quiet week, I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, well, I just thought it was strange. Martin Freeman. I mean, uh, it wouldn't it's... have been my first choice to play any of the characters in Fargo. He's going to play someone exasperated and henpecked, so it kind of makes. Well, sense. yeah, yeah, yeah. He's playing the he character. Always does, doesn't he? Macy played in the movie, apparently. Yeah. Um, still, I mean, I don't know. Can you do an American accent? I'm, I'm a bit iffy about this. I mean, it was a good choice as Bilbo, but uh, I don't know. I, mean, I can't say I'm massively excited about a Fargo TV series. And I saw I'm Terry. Like, I'm excited about the series, but I, yeah, I say I'm not. We particularly... talked about this earlier in a previous podcast, but Terry Gilliam was saying that the idea of doing a Twelve Monkeys TV series was absolutely ridiculous, and he was totally against it. So. <laughs> okay, so let's actually move on to some movies. Um, the BBC did uh, their series on The Sound of Cinema. It's been absolutely fantastic. I've really enjoyed it. Um, I listened to the Radio 3 broadcast last week. Um, also, uh, the series, three episodes on BBC 4. i trying to remember the guy's names. I think it was Nigel Brand uh, who presented it. Um, really fascinating. Went from beginning of cinema and beginning of film scores all the way through to... Uh, where we are now absolutely fantastic and they also run a poll on the nation's favorite movie music now the exception here is that it was bbc radio djs who put the nominations up uh, and then everybody had to vote on their nominations so there's an awful lot of movie music missing uh, from their top i think it was a top 21 mark in the top, top 20, top 20. Mark's cocked up the list. No, God, refresh the please, refre- please refresh the page. Right, okay. <laughs> the is, number one was the BBC Sound of Cinema soundtrack list is was the number one soundtrack. Yeah, not anymore. You're yeah, fine. So. You're, you're fine. <laughs> so <laughs> it's pretty slick. Huh? <laughs> uh, so no surprises, I don't think, with the number one. Well, I've got to say, given the choice, yes, but it was pretty poor. Um, Not necessarily the best music, but I just don't think it was a surprise that the nation chose Star Wars. Yeah, but when you when you actually saw the nominations um, that the DJs had put in, I think they got three each or four each, I can't remember now. Um, there wasn't a great amount of music there to really vote on. Um, quality movie music, or what I'd class as quality uh, music, but interesting. It gets people talking about it, and like I say, the whole series that they've run has been really interesting. What they needed an end product, didn't they, at the end of the day? They needed the concert, so 20, yeah. I guess they had to limit themselves. Yeah. And, I've, and I've got to say, it sounded fantastic. I listened to it online, uh, BBC Three, uh, turned up loud through the gens, and it sounded fantastic. Really, really good. Uh, really, really good concert. Um, they didn't hit a bum note anywhere. 
which is unusual for the BBC Orchestra. <laughs> um, I watched the the movies one at the um, at the proms. You know, they have like a movie prom. Uh, it was terrible. They kept getting thing cues wrong and all the rest of it. But this one was really really good. But in terms of movie music, looking at this list, what's missing? Well, just about everything by John Williams, Jaws, Raiders, <laughs> E.T. <laughs> Spring to mind instantly. I say, as Lord I the Rings. Loathe the films. Uh, it must have said his work for the um, Harry Potter scores are fabulous as well. They're very, very good in in relation to how they work in relation to the film. Uh, I mean, you know, I, just because I don't like them doesn't mean I can't recognise when they're doing something quite effective. I think Howard Shaw's work on Lord of the Rings is exceptional. I'm surprised that's not in there. Just trying to find the list. There was no Braveheart. That's Fantastic as a son of Scotland, oh, that's um, a fantastic score. Yeah, James Horner's um, missing quite noticeably there on a few a few cases. I think his Titanic score, which is very similar actually to Braveheart, is also extremely good. Um, his Star Trek Two, the Wrath of Khan score was excellent. I'm sure. I'm sure. Actually, Chris should be the best person to ask about this. I think Daft Punk deserves a nod for the Tron score. I still absolutely adore that. Uh, it's one of the very few soundtracks where I felt sufficiently compelled to to rush out and buy it on CD. Uh, I think it's fantastic. And um, moves the game on a little bit as well. Again, the film's terrible, but hey. Van Gellis in there? No, that was that's him? what I was going to come on to. Mm. They, they made a big thing of Van Gellis in the final episode of the uh, Sound of Cinema documentary that was on. It was fantastic. Fantastic to, to uh, listen to him in the interviews and see him in his studio playing stuff and then obviously the tracks as well. But nothing in there. I thought Blade Runner would have been in there for a start. Um, Chariots, Chariots of Fire, of fire <laughs> as well, you know. There's not enough uh, uh, any of Morricone. <laughs> By a long shot. <laughs> yeah, I was, before I said that, I was just checking that wasn't in the list because there was one of his. Once Upon a Time in the West, Once Upon a Time in America, both amazing scores that deserve to be mentioned. Uh, oh, but no. I mean... Um, Dark Knight Rises? Why is that in there? Because lots of people have seen it. Which is odd, because of the three Batman films, um, it's uh, the first one is Batman Begins, actually probably has the, 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 the tightest and, and most cohesive score of the three films, so... But you're never going to have a definitive list, way. Right? You could always. I mean, there must find be said that. another one that's absolutely fantastic. Again, it's not. I, I guess it doesn't come under truly great film, so it's uh, it, it's possibly going to count against it. But um, John Powell's effort for the original Born Identity is that's a fantastic score. Really, really good. Well, for me, Bernard Herrmann, he got two in there, and they were very good ones. So they got something right in there. Uh, but Jerry Goldsmith's missing. <laughs> You know, there's only one in there, and it's for Planet of the Apes. It, it's, it's actually a really unlistenable score, actually. Yeah. Uh, it's but, very atonal um, and experimental. In, in that sense, it's quite brave. But yeah, he's written some amazing score. His Alien score is absolutely superb. Just looking through some of the uh, comments on the article, there are. Uh, um, it must be said that, <laughs> other than someone listening at Indian, Indiana Jones's Indian Jones, which is brilliant. <laughs> um, actually, it must have said, someone's listening to Independence Day, and that that's a fine score. Um, very silly film, but again, good score to go with it. So, uh, And um, actually, the Michael, whatever his chops is, has just done the two Star, Star Trek reboots. That Those are both good scores as well, when I think about it. Yeah, that's another one. Danny Elfman. Danny Elfman's missing excess. Yeah, there's a lot of... Yeah, he's it's not there great at all. Scores. Yeah, so yeah, it's one of these lists where um, obviously it's it's you can't do much with it if if people are coming up with their favourites and then everybody just has to vote on their favourites because you're going to get some weird choices in there and there are some weird choices in there. But for us, I mean, what what makes good movie music? What what is well, it that we Phil, listen actually, to? Actually, Phil, that's a good question because like, Apocalypse Now. I mean. Wagner, you can't. That's not a music. It's not part of film score, is it? it? A film score to me is something that's written specifically for a film. So I wouldn't count West Side Stories. But this isn't score. It's not necessarily just this is soundtrack. It's just just music associated with movies. So in which case you could practically have every score Sazy film because he's always used you know things like the Stones extremely well. You know. Tarantino, I love Tarantino. Tarantino soundtracks for, for that reason, but I don't regard those the same as actually something composed where someone sat down and yeah. composed something for the film. No, they've um, mixed score with soundtrack, haven't they? Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong, you do get some slightly un- I mean, where exactly where score ends and music begins is an interesting one because um, stuff like Clint Martinez, uh, the Contagion score, 
is it, it's not classical, but I mean, obviously, it's written for the film. It's bloody marvelous. I, I love that soundtrack. I think it's fantastic. It's always on Spotify. Yeah, it's I'm always extremely good. That. Yeah, um, really and good. it's a nice modern. It's you know, it shows that you can do it. You don't automatically have to just wheel an orchestra out and, and go through the motions. It's a completely different way of going about things, and it's seriously good. Um, another weird example of that is um, Paul Leonard Morgan's uh, the the Dread 3D um film that score again it's a bit more aggressive than the clint martinez on the same basic principle of an electronic score written specifically for the film and, it, and it's great really good makes you want to punch people the other score that i absolutely love which is a little bit out there and a little bit different is uh the score to moon oh yeah clint is mansell, clint, clint mansell. Uh, yeah. fantastic he's done a, a few really really good ones mm. um which are a little bit different and, and he's picked his his films carefully as well, so it, it kind of suits his style. Craig Anderson as well, he's not anywhere on the list there. Good old no. Scottish composer. So this was something that they did cover in documentary, and it was, you know, where does film score end? It, is it music that's just written for the film, or can anything be a score? So one thing they did cover was Forbidden Planet, which is a, a score that's just made up of electronic sounds. There, there is no music in there. Uh, so they covered that aspect of it as well. You know, how far can you push things? How, f- you know, what is what is a score or how, how does it interact with what's actually on screen? And uh, it got really quite interesting and went off on a few tangents. So it's on BBC iPlayer at the moment. So go in and it's only three parts, but really, really interesting. Uh, and the interesting thing is, is you know, the diversions... That the documentary takes along the way, you know, interesting things that have happened uh, through the history of, of film music, which is really good. Uh, well, again, written for the film, not necessarily exactly conventional. I love the Fight Club score by the Dust Brothers. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, um, and, and on the same theme, Chemical Brothers with Hannah. I thought that was a fantastic yes. soundtrack. Really, really good album, that. Film was, uh, film was a bit meh. Soundtrack, fantastic. Yeah, well, I mean, I say this is often the case. I mean, I don't, I don't like uh, the the new the Tron Legacy. I just think Daft Punk were, were cruelly robbed to not even be nominated for an Oscar for that. There was something I'm looking at it now. Um, again, a film I can't get excited about at all. That Tom Cruise Oblivion uh, effort, comparatively recent. It's the first score done by M83, and that's very, very good as well. Um, and actually even better when you don't have to watch the film just just it's on Spotify give it a listen I, I think that's a very very again it's quite clever because it, it's a nice combination of conventional instrumentation underpinned by electronica and I think that works extremely well um, if you know what you're doing and they do so that's that's very good and um, also in the cinemas at the moment I thought the score for Rush was perfect for the film if nothing else, that is another Hans Zimmer one. Uh, and that, that was very, very... I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. In fact, I've got that on order on Amazon. Actually. It's currently out of stock. Funny you mention Oblivion. I actually just listened to that today on Spotify and um, blew me away. I thought it was abso- yeah. absolutely stunning. Uh, and I, I need to listen to it again. I really do. It's, it's really, actually not really a bad good. film. It's worth watching. I didn't quite The it. film did nothing for me, but the score... Yeah, going back to the whole sound and picture thing, I've always been about more more sound than pictures, so I guess that comes into it as well. It's it's quite funny as well that um, just to wrap up on this, that, that certain directors they stick with with composers uh, or they stick with the same music supervisors all the way through their careers. And I'm thinking of uh, Steven Spielberg with John Williams, Bernard Herrmann with um, Alfred Hitchcock. Alfred Hitchcock. Um, I'm trying to think of some others off the top of my head and a lot of them not coming to me but uh, there's that aspect and then there's the director's choices in music as well and we've mentioned Tarantino his ear for for strange um, or niche uh, music but it just works so well with with his visuals um, and I guess the other one there would be Danny Boyle Danny Boyle's got a fantastic ear for music yeah. in his films Hasn't Tarantino admitted on certain occasions, though, that the scene is shot for the piece of music he has in mind? I, I certainly think there are examples. Death Proof, um, the uh, the opening music for Death Proof, as I understand it, had been had long been in mind for something he wanted to use, and basically the intro is done around the music, not vice versa. 
I know that there's a sequence in Goodfellas where um, uh, basically Scorsese reveals a series of murders and he actually shot it to uh, the piano section at the end of uh, Layla, not the famous guitar bit, but the whole last four minute piano piece. Uh, and he filmed it and timed it, the camera moves and everything to that, and then used that piece of music and actually played it, I think, on the set. I know that um, Marconi wrote the, the, the uh, score because it spent so long in production getting the money and everything. By the time they only got around to shooting, once or a time in America, the score had been written in advance and, and he actually played the score on the set and shot to it, which is unusual, obviously. That was another one that was in the documentary. It's almost like oh, really? an, it's almost like an opera, the way that uh, yeah, the final yeah. the final gun battle, the way that the actors move across the screen and the way that the shots are composed and so on to the music. Um, yeah, fantastic. So if you haven't seen the documentary, well worth going to going and watching that. On I Netflix. haven't, and I will, Phil. Thanks for pointing it out to me. You're more than welcome, Stephen. <laughs> A rare moment of unity and cheerfulness. Yeah. Get some more fucking interviews <laughs> done first, though, eh? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you work on the database first before you f*** off and watch something. Oh, bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it for the AV Forums podcast this week. Thanks very much for listening and downloading. And my thanks to Mark Botwright. I can give you love and rocking horses and dancing. Mark Hodgkinson. Death to Ming. Ed Selly. You have a baby? Is it alive? And Steve Withers. Easy, we're just going to nail a lot of girls named Stephanie. Don't forget you can follow us on Twitter at AV Forums and Facebook.com forward slash AV Forums. You can bookmark AVForums.com for the latest reviews, news and video. Uh, plus, why not leave us a rating on iTunes if you enjoyed the show. I'm Phil Hinton. Thanks very much for listening. We'll see you again next Wednesday. My dinner is ready, so I shall catch you next time. Half past uh, five? Are you 90? We've got kids. What? We've got kids. Got to eat with, we're eating with the kids. Don't no, you don't just always. feed them. What are you eating? Then? Alphabetti spaghetti? <laughs> no, we're having a roast. A roast? A roast? Yeah. Monday evening. Oh, yeah. Monday night. Roast turkey. That's... I could know what? Turkey? What? Have, you what? Have, you what? Have you opened your presents yet? <laughs> yeah. <in a> it's <laughs> Queen's speech. It's Christmas every day, yeah, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Explains a lot. <laughs> yeah.